Today, I'd like to um, introduce you to our special guest, Patty Stove from K Line Shipping, who is also the managing director of the Long Island Import Export Association, and also Andrea Ratai, who will be speaking to us about international banking and trade. So um, please join me in welcoming Patty Stove and Andrea Ratai. this come back up for us and um, start with let's see here we go okay why don't you just go full screen well you already know that that's okay. great good afternoon everybody can you hear me like this so i don't have to lean into the mic is that good loud and clear great Welcome, everybody. My name is Patty Stoff. I'm with uh, K-Line America and the Long Island Import-Export Association. And it's really a pleasure to be with you today. Our goal today, Andre and I, is to help you see our world of international business and international finance. Think outside the box. We love the industry we're in. I think this is a very good year to consider jobs and education in international trade. We'll tell you more, a little bit more about that later on. So we have quite a few presentations. I'm going to kick off with my first one on, glo on global trade, the industry of international business as it stands with shipping and the association. We're also going to focus strongly, which is very important to our organization, is Homeland Security initiatives. And we'll tell you more about the Homeland Security team that we work with. Then I'll have a video which the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey was kind enough to send to me, which will give you a real picture of how the port operates, what it looks, what a ship looks like, and the handling of all the containers at the port. And I know the Port Authority has given us brochures and literature for everybody. Some of those stats we've listed, most of it is just going to be new information for you to enjoy you know, at your leisure after class. Andre is going to come in after. I'm finished with those two and talk about trade finance. And then I'm going to come back um, and try to have a little bit more fun about etiquette, business etiquette, and etiquette and life after school, and things that you should think about when you start out in the workplace, all coming from true experiences of students that we have worked with. K-Line America actually stands for Kawasaki Kisen Kaishen. And everybody knows Kawasaki for their motorcycles, for their jet skis. My Kawasaki is the Ocean Container Vision of K-Line and with strictly import-export cargo ships bringing freight around the world. Um, K-Line also stands for Kaisen, K-A-I-S-E-N, which means continuous improvement in Japanese. And the Japanese philosophy is a very serious one. We always aim to improve our services, our fleet, our equipment, and make sure what we do today we do better tomorrow, especially for the safety of world commerce. The Long Island Import-Export Association is an organization that I have been on the board of and an active member of for about 15 years now. I am now the director of the association and our role is really just to educate the international community in the tri-state area as well as Manhattan. I will be talking today about all of these topics. We'll talk about the Long Island Import Export Association. I'll give you a quick synopsis of the conference topics that we've selected for the season. I'll tell you a little bit about our directors and how they've come to be on our board of directors. Different modes of transportation. You have ocean, you have air, you have truck, you have rail. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about the two gateways. Of course, the biggest ones are the Port of New York, New Jersey, and the Port of LA, Long Beach. We're going to talk about the Global Forecast 2010, international trade, how we see it. I'll talk more about port operations. Big focus will be, as I said, on Homeland Security, U.S. Customs and Border Protection. And then my next presentation will be Career Opportunities in Global Trade. Just a little bit about the Long Island Import-Export Association. Real, our real mission is to educate the international community, Long Island, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan. We have people flying in from all over because of the topics and the speakers that we bring in. And we're really there just to educate companies so they do it right, they know how to do it, and we do it safely. Conference topics. As you can see, these are all the topics that we have covered. We, big is on U.S. Customs and Import Compliance. We talk about port security. And I'll get more into all those topics as well. We, we talk about exports and emerging markets. 
We talk about free trade agreements. We're always opening up the borders and countries to new trade and new trading partners, both import and export. Very important. We'll talk about air cargo security and the new security safety regulations. Very big for us is green. Green is everywhere, and I'm sure that's very big for your generation because your focus is so much on green. We're bringing it into transportation today, whether it be green with the trucks that are hitting the road. All trucks that are older than 1997 are going to have to be taken off the road for clean air. We're talking about the ships that used to be plugged into harbor, these monster container ships with all the fuel stacks. They now have to shut down, and we're plugging them in at the ports. Big savings in fuel in our ozone, and we're really trying to think about that and the initiatives to give the transportation people for doing so. We talk about insurance issues, how to protect your cargo. You know, if you're shipping to countries that are not safe or that are high risk, how to insure your product, how to worry and safeguard yourself against terrorism risk, whether it be your cargo or whether it be yourself when you travel. In our industry, everybody travels abroad. That's just what we do to conduct business. So we need to make sure that you know the levels of other terrorist threats, how to travel safely, and our speakers come in and talk about all of these issues. And then, of course, we have experts like Andrea from HSBC Bank, and we talk about international finance, currencies, how to buy your product, how to sell your product, and we do that as well. So we cover quite a bit, as you can see, in topics. I just want to catch up here. What we do with our board of directors with the association is we meet twice a year, and our board represents an entire spectrum of the community, and they bring to the table topics that they know have impacted their operation on a day-to-day -day basis, and we ask them to bring it to us, and that's how we create the topics that are most important to us. Our board of directors represent all aspects of business. their importers and exporters, their finance, law, CPA firms, all the big CPA firms are our members, all the banks are members all transportation companies, the trucking companies, the ocean carriers, all the airlines are members of our association. Um, we have law firms and we have documentation companies that deal with the paperwork so the cargo can move in and out. Our board of directors comes to us with a solid level of experience. They come with the enthusiasm we need to spread the word to what's happening out in the industry. And they help us plan our sessions during the whole year and then we, we move forward with that. How do we get help? Well, what we do is we educate our members and our guests that come to the meeting, and there are lots of different websites that you can go to. I know our PowerPoint presentations are going to be posted on one of your school sites, so don't take notes, but just, and I'm not gonna even read these, but it'll give you an idea of all the different places you can go to if you're looking for help, if you're looking for guidance. Of course, we're at the top. We have Export Assistance Center, which will help new startup export companies. We're looking for export business. We have the Department of Homeland Security and Customs and Border Protection work as a team. Of course, they also work with the FBI. Um, we have TSA. Um, those are, that's the team that works at the airport for security at the airports. The FAA is the team at the airport that works for safety of product on the plane versus security on the plane. And we have Department of Agriculture, a very big thing. What are we bringing into the country? Are we bringing in food and agriculture and meat and flowers that might somehow pollute or destroy our water systems or our air or our supermarkets or harm us? So we work very closely with the Department of Agriculture. And um, Bureau of Industry and Security also all for trade. Everybody, everybody's helped along the way. And how do we get our goods there? Just give you an idea, of course, we talked about different modes of transportation, and we have the aircraft for cargo and passenger. We have trucking, of course, and we have the ocean container ship, which is what a K-line ship would look like, and that is berthed at a port. Ocean shipping. Um, give you an idea, of course, I have to use K-line pictures wherever I can. Um, this is just the front of one of our vessels, and it's loaded with containers on top of the deck and below, and this is one of the K-Line containers. They are now 
growing by leaps and bounds due to the change in import trade. The ships can hold, and we'll give you pictures down the road so you have a perspective of it, at least 8,000 different 8,000 containers on a vessel. They used to hold three and four. We have different ways to bring the ships in. We could bring them through the Panama Canal or the Suez Canal for East Coast trade. And of course, we bring them directly into the West Coast for West Coast trade. And we'll talk about expansion plans at all of these different facilities and ways to get your cargo in. Types of ocean containers. The TEU and the FEU is 40 foot equivalent unit or 20 foot equivalent unit. We also now have 45 foot containers. All these containers are eight foot six high. Now we have high cube containers, so now they're even nine foot six high. We have different size containers based on what you're bringing in. If you're bringing something that's big and bulky, like, like electronics, big boxes with a lot of packing, you'll fill up a bigger container faster. If you're bringing in smaller, heavier cargo, like chemicals, um, and plastics and, th and things that weigh more, you'll fill a 20-foot container faster because there's a weight factor. So you have your options on how you would like to ship your cargo. You are seeing the, uh, the beauty of the Panama Canal and a ship in the Panama Canal. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, give you a little facts about the Panama Canal. As you can see, there's a big container ship in there. It's my competitor, but it was a nicer picture, so I figured I would, I would load it for them. The first ship that sailed through the Panama Canal was in 1914. This canal connects vessels and trade from the Atlantic to the Pacific. There are two sets of locks, as you'll see up in the top right corner, two sets of locks where the ships can come in and go down. Once the ship hits the top of the lock, they actually shut down the vessel. And there are, if you see at the front of the vessel, it looks like a little rail it actually will hook up on either sides of the vessel. And in the front of the vessel, it looks like there's like a little raft, a little inflatable, red inflatable. That's not the ship that's actually like a little raft. We will hook up the front of the vessel from both sides from underneath and literally drag this vessel down through the canal to get it out of there. There are the two locks. Um, it takes, no, where are my little notes? I just had some new data that came in through the canal, through the port sent it to me. So when they first built this canal, the ships were much smaller and they thought the canal would hold everything. And the ships that were 3,000 containers, this mother vessel now can hold about 8,000 containers. So obviously the canal wasn't wide enough to take all the new ships. So they really do need to rebuild and expand on this canal for the new wave of ships that is coming in. This canal is 50 miles long, so it's a long way for us to be dragging this vessel down the waterway, but that's what it takes. 714 vessels came through the canal last year, which is a huge amount of vessels. It takes eight hours to pull this vessel through the canal, and basically it's about a 24-hour turnaround time. You can just pull up one of these vessels and get in line like you're in a parking lot and sail right through. The larger ocean carriers, Kalon is one of the larger carriers, Maersk Line is a very large carrier. The larger carriers have appointments. We make appointments with the Canal Authority. They know when we're coming. We have fixed day of the week operations. So they know every Tuesday morning at so-and-so hours, we're going to be getting in line to get through the canal. And they're actually waiting for us to do so. The cost to get through the canal is approximately $140,000 each way per vessel. Now, that price changes based on the weight of the vessel going through and the size of the vessel going through. I just read that um, one of the Disney cruise ships came through and it cost them $315,000 to come through the canal because it's so large with all of the passengers and all the crew, $315,000 just to come through the canal on, on a Disney cruise ship. They also said that when the canal first opened up, um, it was as cheap as a dollar. They had a swimmer. They actually charged him to swim down the canal. So they charged him a dollar to get through the canal. <laughs> but yachts come through the canal, cargo ships come through the canal, um, pleasure boats come through the canal. They all have to pay. And of course, they pay based on tonnage and weight and what they're doing, but everybody has to pay. 1999, we had always operated the Panama Canal because it was such a critical shipping route and we had to protect its safety from commerce and trade. In 1999, we gave control of the Panama Canal to the Panamanian government. So they are now watching the canal, supervising the canal, 
but we will always have military presence at the canal to ensure that there's no attacking of piracy or any problem on any of the vessels coming through the canal. I touched on a, a lot of these topics, but what we're going to be doing at the canal now, due to the ships being so large, is we really need to expand it. So there's a massive expansion in the works, which should be done by 2014. The first ship that you saw came through in 1914 was 5,000 containers. The ships that are coming through today are 12,000 containers. So in order for us to be able to accommodate that ship through the canal, we need to widen the canal. And that's what we're looking to do. Um, in the meantime, we cannot take the bigger ships in, which is actually limiting the amount of cargo coming to East Coast ports. So we need to change that, or most of that cargo is going to continue going through the West Coast or through some of the southern ports. When the cargo comes in to the New York area, it has to go under the Bayonne Bridge, and the tides are too high. So now they're actually dredging the waterway underneath the Bay Bayonne Bridge as well and working the infrastructure around the bridge. So it's very complicated, but we have to pave the way for more commerce and bigger ships coming in. If we have questions as I go, feel free and just call out. I'd be happy to take them as we go along. I know Andrea and I were saying we can go after each presentation. We could wait till the end. I think it might be better to go with each topic as we're covering. So if you have any questions, feel free and definitely please ask them, okay? We welcome them. The post Patamax vessels, those are actually the vessels that we're talking about that's the new wave of the very large ships that are coming in. And the ones that cannot make it through the Panama Canal now are going through the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal links the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea. It opened in 1869. It's the largest canal in the world, and there are no locks, and there's no depth restrictions. So any ship of any size could actually go through this passageway of the Suez Canal. It's open all the time and accepts all kinds of uh, vehicles. Um, it takes 47 ships a day, um, which is much less. So that was about, seven, I looked, it was about 17,000 ships in 2009 versus about 140,000 ships through the Panama Canal. So there's a long way to go. And why there's so fewer ships? Because it's further to get to. It's a slower transit time. So if you want to get fastest to New York, you're going to go through the Panama. If you don't have a choice or the Panama is backed up and you've got ships out in the harbor, then you'll have an option of going through the Suez Canal. So it's just another option to go through. And as far as we're concerned, thinking about safety of the ships and ocean transportation, it's nice to know that you know, God forbid something should happen to one waterway, we do have another open for us to conduct trade, so trade does not stop, which is the worst thing that could possibly happen to the economy. Two major gateways. Um, I'll always talk about New York and New Jersey first, because it's ours, of course. And this will just give you a perspective of how many containers have come in over the past three years. And you saw from 2007 to 2008, we went up. And actually, the years prior to that was always an increase in business. The economy was doing well, and there was quite a bit of cargo coming in. In 2009, last year, as we know, the economy hit rock bottom. People unemployment rose to over 10%. People started, stopped buying. And imports dropped you know, severely. This just, gives you, sorry, this just gives you an idea of the main container imports that we bring into this country. Um, and the exports that we ship out to other countries as well. You'll see quite a bit with the exports, we're talking about the paperboard. When we finish using um, crates, cardboard containers, and they're all broken down, all of those are actually bundled up and re-exported. And all that paper and all the metal scrap and the plastic scrap, like all the bottles that we're recycling, we're exporting, I guess, all of our garbage. And all that garbage then is being recycled for the next generation of product, either a paper good, more boxes and cartons, more water bottles, and things like that. And that's what we're doing with the metal scrap and all the parts and all the paperboard. Our top import and export trading partners um, should come as no surprise. Of course, China, Hong Kong is always the largest by far. And these are just the other trading partners that we have. Um, that we work with. Port of LA, Long Beach. We kind of put it together because while the two cities 
are next to each other. They, they combine themselves as one port for statistical purposes and um, for docking reasons. And this just gives you an idea of how much volume is coming through the port of LA Long Beach. And as you can see, the volumes are absolutely enormous. Um, it is about two and a half times the volume that we have coming to the East Coast ports because it's the closest port from Asia in. You know, you leave Asia and you're at the West Coast ports in about 10 days or so. And these are the top containerized imports that we have coming in. With the West Coast port, there is no restriction whatsoever of vessel size. So any vessel of any size can dock on the West Coast. Um, big reason for the West Coast being so strong as well is it is a major um, location for warehousing distribution centers. It's very easy to use the first port of entry, discharge your cargo, bring it to a warehouse, and then distribute it throughout the country. All the biggest companies like Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmarts, Kmarts, they all have distribution facilities in the LA Long Beach area. This way they bring the cargo in, it goes right into a warehouse, they break it down and they ship it out versus wasting any time. I'm going to back up one moment to um, ocean shipping. What we're doing now further to protect green, uh, besides, as we said, um, plugging in at the ports and working with the truckers and, and the rail carries on the road, is we're slowing down the speed of the vessels as we sail them. It's adding on about two or three days in transit time. I'll give you an idea. Hong Kong, China to the west coast is about 10 to 12 days and Hong Kong, China to New York via all water is about 22 days. So that just gives you an idea of where the transit times are if you're waiting to get product into this country. And now we're just trying to slow down the ships. But the price of fuel, as we know, we fill up at the gas stations all the time. And when fuel was over $100 a barrel, it was an absolute nightmare for the transportation carriers because in the past our pricing included fuel. Now we have pricing separate and we have fuel broken out from that and it's um, updated quarterly. So all shippers have to pay fuel as the fuel rates go up. Air freight option, of course, the fastest way to get cargo to market. It's the most expensive also. If you move a 40-foot container's worth of freight, it's about $4,000. If you move it by air freight, it's about $24,000. And then there's a difference in transit time. So you could talk about 22 days versus two days so I guess what we say to all of our customers, this is your transit time and this is your cost. What is it worth to you? If you have high value cargo, you'll be willing to fly it in. If you're not going to meet your market date, then you're going to fly it in. But it gives importers and exporters an option of how they're going to move their cargo. Global Forecast 2010. This is really nice to be able to type that first sentence that we put in there with trade growing 12 to 15 percent and maybe we'll ask why and what are the theories beyond that and basically we meet with a lot of forecasters and we talk about a lot of our largest customers we talk to we call them the big box retailers the Kmart's the Walmart's the Targets we ask them what they're forecasting the big department stores and basically these were the theories that they all gave us and we know that they are fact because we're already finishing up March so we see the first quarter of 2010 Holiday sales were excellent in December 2009, which was a very positive look for 2010. Um, we feel that the unemployment has finally, we hope, bottomed down and stopped at the 10%, 8 to 10% level. Um, we think that is stabilized at this point. We see that our industry has started to hire once again, and they are absolutely looking to expand their teams. A lot of people were let go. A lot of people were given early retirement. But the industry is definitely growing. We saw the forecast for trade is growing. We see people feeling more confident about it. People are shopping a little bit more. The stores are showing some activity. We see that they're spending. And most importantly, last year, we imported as little as possible because we were so sure nobody was going to buy all the inventory we had in this country. The inventories are at an all-time low. So at this point, retailers have no choice but to bring product in to replenish inventories in the United States. 
And based on the first quarter sales, it's definitely looking very positive that the economy and the enthusiasm is picking up for retail sales. My favorite part, uh, Homeland Security. Everybody you know, knows and remembers 9-11, even if you weren't actively involved at that time of what was happening, you're reminded of it every single day. And all of us moving cargo around the country and traveling abroad and dealing with commerce worldwide, Homeland Security is absolutely our number one mission. We have many par partnerships um, with Homeland Security initiatives. First and foremost, of course, is Customs and Border Protection. We work with uh, the TSA, as we talked about, that was um, airline security. The FAA was airline safety. Immigration and Customs Enforcement is basically Border Patrol, Canada and Mexico, and all of our NAFTA trade is seriously impacted. And the ICE team is very important with um, people here illegally, people that have not you know, come to and filed for immigration papers. We need to know that you're here, and um, we need to make sure everybody's working here legally and safely. We work very closely with our police, Nassau County Police Departments and Suffolk County Police Departments. All of the police departments have Homeland Security Task Force. Very impressive, actually. All of our universities and colleges have security teams. Your school has a security team, and we work with those as well. They're responsible for safety at the school, um, if there should be a lockdown, if there should be something hazardous on the property, if somebody should come on board with a weapon or a threat, you do have a security team on your campus. And um, it's very important that everybody knows what the measures are that will be taken. And all these offices can easily be contacted. The websites have been provided for you. Customs on, on high alert. Where are you? This is, um, I'll go to K9 last. This is a, a vacuous machine. It is at all major ports in the United States and abroad. We actually send it abroad. And what happens is a container that's on a truck will drive through this metal detector. And it will actually see clear through the steel of this container. It will show you exactly what's in the container. It'll show if things were packed properly, if things have shifted, if they don't look like but they should be right. And when they go through, the x-rayer also knows what's supposed to be in the container. So if it doesn't make sense the size of the boxes or the stowage of the container, they will automatically be able to pull that container over for inspection. We send a Homeland Security team to all major ports in Asia and Europe. We teach them how to use this equipment. We make sure they know what they're looking at. Because it's a two-fold process. We have to make sure that cargo that's leaving the United States for their country is safe. We want to do that for them. So when that container's on their road, they're not subject to any terrorism. And we want to make sure that all the big containers that are coming into our borders are inspected from them as well. And we want them to take it as seriously as we do. So this vacuous machine is the x-ray machine. They're buying as many as possible. And they are x-raying the cargo. There's different security for passenger aircraft and cargo aircraft. When you are on a plane and you're traveling, everything on your plane has been inspected and x-rayed, everything. The belly of the plane that we're sitting in, only one third of it is our luggage. Two thirds of it is cargo that we've agreed to accept from somebody shipping cargo. All of that cargo was x-rayed and inspected. I know we might talk about why are there always incidences on you know, the Christmas Day bomber. The chemicals are a very difficult issue to keep a handle on, the mixture of chemicals. And that's why when you travel, there's such restrictions on how many ounces of liquid you could take and you know, how you're checked and your shoes and your hats and your jackets and your laptops. It's just, um, just work closely with the TSA team. If you're traveling and you don't know what you can take with you, go on the TSA.gov website and they'll remind you what you could take. Um, but I hope that you as students and travelers and all of us as business people don't go to the airport and say, why do I have to take off my shoes? Or why are you throwing out my $20 bottle of hair conditioner? Well, you should know better. So we hope that everybody here will think safely when they travel. Cargo aircraft is strictly freight, UPS planes, DHL planes. By October 01, all that freight will be 100% screened as well. So that is the next leg of our security layering approach. 
Vessel security. There's a lot of vessel security. Um, when the ship is in harbor, before we even allow it to dock in New York, our Coast Guard goes to the vessel and boards the vessel. They interview and they look at the captain. They look at the crew. They profile them. They make sure that there's no stress in their, uh, their eyes, that everything looks like everything is under control. And then they guide them into the port. All the ships at the port and all the bulkheads are inspected nonstop with a team of divers. Divers are swimming around the bulkhead and the port 24-7 to make sure that nobody has done thought of the same thing come and maybe you know adhered bombs or anything that might be a terrorist threat to us at the ports. So there's just there's a lot of security going on. And uh, you know it's a layered approach. We approach it from every angle. And I think too often when we hear in the papers or we hear the press that we're not doing enough to, to protect ourselves or protect our people when we travel, I really think that's not true. And a lot of what we don't know is not meant for us to know and that's why it's confidential. But I do have to tell you I think our Homeland Security team is really doing an outstanding job. And Andrea and I, have, you know, we have our meetings and they come and they speak and they tell us situations that have come to play that they have already stopped and they have um, thwarted before we were in a terrorist situation. And there have been situations over the years. So it's very nice to see that they're working so hard to protect us, and they really are. The TSA puppy program, you're smiling, Andrea, right? That was, that was um, really fun. We talk about a layered approach for security. And we always talk about the air, the ocean, the this or that. The TSA Puppy Program has become a really, really big program for us, besides the fact they're absolutely adorable. Um, they are fully trained. The program became formal after 9-11, and we really needed the canine assistance because we just did not have enough manpower to literally inspect and check and see what was going on. We predominantly, we, they, the TSA team, predominantly uses Labrador Retrievers. They found that it's just been the best breed of dog to work with. They'll use Golden Retrievers also and German Shepherds, but Labs were the best. It takes nine weeks to a year to train these little puppies, and they have their own handler. Um, we had a meeting a few months ago. The handlers came with their puppies. We had two handlers with the puppies, and they were puppies. They were wild and crazy puppies. We knew we couldn't touch them. We were one that in advance. And they actually hid um, explosives in two parts of our conference room. One was actually under the dais, and one was in the back of the room. And then they ran around the room twice, and we all had to sit in our seats. And then the dogs were allowed to go anywhere. And the dogs were jumping on and off tables, on and off literature tables, on and off our chairs. And the minute they arrive at something that they smell, they stop and they sit, like waiting for their biscuit. They found the both sites twice immediately. So they found the explosives immediately. So that was really pr pretty exciting stuff for us to see them in action. They're trained for either explosive or drugs. They're not trained to do both. It's an entirely different training facility. So we have teams that do both. Um, they're mainly in airports and mass transit systems. You'll see them in the airports, especially if you're flying to a place that might be considered you know, drug cartel territory. I was just in Costa Rica when I got off the plane. Two dogs were waiting at the entrance of the plane the minute we left the plane. And we all had to walk past the two dogs as we left. So they know what they're doing. It's that late security approach. They know where to put them. They're very big in the subways. As we know, we'll see them in the subways. Very big on cruise ships. This was a big saver. When the cruise ships come in and they have thousands and thousands of pieces of luggage, I don't know if any you know who has cruised here, but when you come in, there's a holding room for your luggage. And they're set in aisles. And before you get to your luggage, the dogs have already been in that room. And the dogs have already gone up and down the rows of that luggage. So any luggage that the dog might smell something on is automatically taken away and moved to a separate room. And we have seen that happen. We have seen people say, your luggage is not here, and escorted to another room. So um, it's really a zero tolerance. These dogs could smell, they said, a little seed. They could smell anything. You know, they were saying, I have sons that are in their 20s. So we were talking, and they're saying, if you're on spring break, and you had a good time, and you were in Mexico, and even if you didn't bring anything back with you, but you touched something in your luggage, that puppy is going to smell your party time. 
So they're that sensitive, and we're going to make sure that everything coming into our country has already been inspected one way or another. To date, there are 400 puppies that are trained, and hopefully there'll be many, many more um, in the time to come. And I thank you. Does anybody have any questions on security, on trade, on the industry? Um, if you think about it as we go, I'm going to be coming back on in a little while, but right now what I'd like you to see um, is I have a video, if I could figure out how to work this. Okay. Who would like to help me with this and close this out? I want to put the video on. Okay, what we have here is the Port Authority of New York sent us a three minute video. And this video is outstanding and will show you exactly what it looks like to get a vessel at the port and to operate that vessel and then get the cargo from New York and distribute it throughout the country. Enjoy. last 10 years, we've seen our cargo volumes double, and we think in the next 20 years we'll see another doubling of that cargo. That means that not only do we have to be able to handle larger ships, but once that ship discharges its cargo here, we have to be able to efficiently move it to its ultimate destination on land. As a result of that, the Port Authority has committed nearly $650 million to the development of the rail system within the port. That means better on-dock rail facilities as well as additional storage track, which will dramatically improve our ability to handle more cargo faster and, and actually in a less expensive way. We're actually putting on-dock rail at each one of our container facilities and we'll have a capacity of about 1.5 million lifts a year as a result of, of these projects. So wherever a container is offloaded from a ship, uh, rail is going to be close by. This will improve not only our rail service, but it also will allow us to dramatically improve air quality. Each of these trains represents a substantial reduction in truck traffic. For each container that we put on, on rail, we're removing uh, one and a half truck moves. We also believe that we can shorten the distance for which rail is efficient for. Today, rail business is really efficient for distances of about 500 miles. We believe we can shorten that distance. We're beginning to improve services to locations like Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to Buffalo, New York. It's gonna be a tremendous advantage. It's sort of like getting on an airplane in New York and flying directly to Los Angeles as opposed to having to change planes in Chicago. We've seen about a 17% per year increase in the demand for rail service. And in the future, we'd like to see the percentage of our business improve by moving out by rail. We think this is an important element of our strategy going forward. That is your port operation. I hope they gave you a perspective of what it means to bring a ship into the port and take all those containers off that vessel. It is a very tedious job, and they're going in one at a time with an extremely high crane and a guy sitting up in this cab. And with four hooks, he's got to catch the four corner posts of this container and lift it off and either bring it onto the ground or put it right on a truck that's waiting to drive it off. So it's a very time consuming process. Um, it works, the port is growing, it's a beautiful operation, and I hope this gave you a perspective on shipping world and ocean transportation and cargo security and uh, what we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis for you. Now I would like to uh, welcome Andrea to take over the finance. Thanks. Um, some of what's on the slide today, I'm gonna take a few minutes and, and just explain. So um, 
My name is Andrea Ratte. I'm with HSBC Bank. I am a regional trade manager, which really just means I manage myself and the territory that I cover. I happen to cover a very active trading geography because it is uh, downstate New York and Connecticut. Very different markets. Downstate New York, um, there's, there's, a, there's a real concentration of the textile and apparel uh, industry, and so these are the importers who bring in a lot of the products that you see when you go to Target or Walmart or pretty much any store that you go to today that's not food related for the most part. Um, and some of the other areas I cover, there's a lot of manufacturing going on. And um, so you'll get into machinery and equipment and some technology and other things. So Patty talked to you about the physical infrastructure for trade. I'm going to talk to you about the finance infrastructure for trade, which actually parallels the logistics side. And I'll give you a quick example, a story I heard. I always hear, one thing I love about banking is you have a privilege to meet all kinds of companies. And Patty, you'll appreciate this story. Up in um, central Connecticut, there is a, uh, a very old company that manufactures steel mills. Now, I didn't know really what a steel mill was till I actually saw one in a room. And these are actually enormous pieces of equipment. I'm not talking about a steel mill like a building, but an actual piece of equipment. These, these um, pieces of equipment are so heavy that when they are sent off to, for export, this huge truck, I don't even know how long it is, must be 150 feet at least, it has to be loaded, this equipment. And there's a bridge in uh, upstate New York across the Hudson, the uh, Newburgh Bridge. This equipment is so heavy that the company can only ship at 2 o'clock in the morning when they can close the bridge down, because nothing else can be on the bridge because the equipment is so heavy. So these are the kind of challenges that exporters and importers face, is the very physical side, um, which I always find fascinating to see. So I'm going to talk about the less physical side. You can go ahead and switch. Um, I want to define appetite. I realized after I made these slides, I used some terms that bankers are very accustomed to. And appetite, I don't know about you, but at lunchtime, it just makes me hungry. But when we talk about appetite in banking, we're really talking about what is, what, is your, what is your want, or what are you willing to take on? Um, so when we talk about appetite in banking, we were, we're referring to credit appetite. So it could be if you go for a car loan, um, the bank might say, well, we're not really, we don't have the appetite for more car loans. We've made a lot of car loans, and we're full on car loans. You know? uh, so that's what, when we use the term appetite. Uh, so many of you may have read about it or maybe have had direct experience as well, but since oct about October of a year and a half, about 18 or 20 months ago, um, everything collapsed. And it wasn't just Lehman Brothers. It was commodities prices. Um, it was a whole slew of things. And uh, because of that, the reaction was, we had this, you've heard the term, the, the bubble. We had the whole economic bubble, and there was a lot going on. There was a lot of shipping going on. There was a lot of buying and selling. And then it all just, boom, stopped, froze. Um, and one of the outcomes of that was where bankers have been looking at risk a certain way, now we had to step back and look at risk a little bit differently. And, and when I talk about international banking, I'm really talking about, um, and what bankers do is, we price risk. So if we're going to lend money to, not to pick on anybody, but we lend money to you, we might charge a certain percentage. We lend money to somebody else in the, in the room. Um, and it might be a higher or lower percentage because the risk of each of those people is different. The, the repayment risk is really what we're talking about. Banks lend money, but with the idea that we're going to be paid back. So if it's going to be riskier for me to lend money to you, I'm going to charge you more than I might charge somebody else in the room because I know my risk of repayment with the other person is lower. So that all ties into appetite. Um, and what we're seeing now, 18 to 20 months later, is that appetite is getting a little bit better, but we're a little more careful about our choices. 
Uh, so it's kind of like when you want to lose weight, you know, and when before, before you just ate whatever you want, but now maybe you want to think about your choices. So we're seeing a lot more structure. Actually, I think what we're seeing is things went really crazy and now we've pulled back and been more reasonable about how we're going to price risk. Any questions? Okay. Terms of trade. Um, this ties into what Patty was talking about, actually. Uh, it, it, terms of trade can include what the buyer is going to be responsible for taking care of uh, to get a shipment across the water or what the seller might have to arrange. And so we talk about terms of trade as being on a spectrum. And at one end is what we call open account, and at the other end is payment in advance. So who can tell me, what do you think payment in advance is? It's a pretty descriptive term. Who's paying for, who's doing something first? Go ahead. So I guess the, the people that are, have to pay in advance in order to get the loan, have to pay your deposit. Right. Exactly. Payment in advance. I just had to get, have to get my oven fixed. I had to order new parts and the guy said, you need to give me a deposit. He didn't trust me. So his appetite for my risk was not very good. <laughs> um, and on the other end of that, we have open account, which is the opposite, which is the buyer can pay afterward. So has anybody ever bought anything on eBay? You know how, okay, so you're buying from somebody you don't know, or maybe you've sold stuff on, on, on eBay. You don't know that other person. So who's going to make the first move? Who's going to pay first or who's going to ship, who's going to mail the stuff first? And that is a classic problem in international trade. So what we saw in the last 18 to 20 months was really that sellers were concerned about not just about the payment risk of their buyers, because that had increased, but they were even concerned about orders being canceled. Maybe Target saw that the inventory that Patty referred to wasn't moving out of the store, so we don't need to buy as much. We're going to cancel that order. Meanwhile, the seller had already started to produce. So when we talk about vendors, we're talking about sellers or suppliers. Um, at the same time, a buyer, for the very same reason, because it's taking inventory longer to move, they might need extended payment terms. So there was a lot of pressure on everybody to get cash and what we call liquidity through the cycle. So you read a lot in the papers, it's not a fun time to be a banker or to tell people you're a banker because they think that we're, we're holding on to TARP money, which by the way, HSBC Bank did not take any TARP money. <laughs> so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the impact of the global recession. I just mentioned eBay. Now, once you've dealt with a particular eBay seller a few times, you know that they've been well rated. You might feel more comfortable giving, sending them a deposit or sending money before they actually ship because there's some trust. Um, well, because of the financial crisis, companies who were trading with each other had less trust or confidence in each other. And why is that? Well, because if a supplier couldn't get financing in order to produce the product they were going to sell, they weren't going to make their shipment dates. If a buyer couldn't borrow the money to pay for the merchandise, then you have a problem of non-payment. Um, so because of that, their companies were looking more at their cash flow cycles. Um, and basically when we talk about the cash flow cycle is how long does it take from the time that you either have to pay out money for raw materials or borrow money from raw, for raw materials to the time when you actually get paid for the product you made, that's your cash, we call it your cash conversion cycle or your cash cycle. So that's really important. Working capital is the lifeblood of small companies um, and actually any companies. But the difference between really big companies and then small companies is really big companies like GE, they can go to the capital markets and they can issue more stock or they can issue some bonds. They have access. Whereas the, the issue with the small and medium sized businesses is they can really either borrow from their relatives or from the bank. And so that's why there's been a big squeeze on the banks too to step up and provide more support. Uh, so as, as I've been describing, we really saw what we call the return of risk, where when we were in the bubble situation, it was life is good, everybody's paying on time, everybody's shipping on time, and now we saw that start to change. So what 
I do at the bank and what colleagues of mine in, in the trade and supply chain division do is we look at how to, how to mitigate risk or reduce risk and how to enhance or improve cash flow. So when we, now we're going to take all of this and we're going to place it in an international setting. We're moving from eBay to moving through the Panama Canal and across borders. So really what we talk about in banking is risk. And we don't mean it in a bad way, we just mean you have to understand your situation. And any time you make a decision, even if it's in life, you have to say, okay, What's the probability that this will work out this way or this will work out another way? You're assessing your risk. We're always assessing our risk. When we make a left turn at an intersection, you're assessing your risk. So that's what bankers do vis-a-vis -vis companies. So we look at what are the risks? How can we take out some of that risk? How can we reduce that risk? The other issues are the financing that I talked about before. Next slide. Um, you know, I decided I don't really like this chart, but <laughs> um, it was already in. So I, I just want to draw your attention to the bottom line and the line on the left. Uh, the words on the left are kind of the different factors we'll look at, but basically the buyer's risk and the, sell and the supplier's risk are inverse, where if we go back to the example of the payment in advance or the open account, if the seller says, I want payment in advance in order to ship, who's taking the risk? The buyer or the seller? Uh, right, because the buyer already paid. How does he know that the seller's gonna ship, right? And the opposite is true with open account, where the seller will ship and they're not sure that they're going to get paid, right? So this is really um, just a visual of what happens as supplier risk goes up uh, and as buyer risk goes up, what happens to the payment terms, whether you require payment in advance or a deposit or some, some uh, way to reduce your risk. So if I'm going to sell you, if the oven repair guy is going to sell me a part or, or uh, is going to fix the stove for $100 and he has to buy a part for 50 and he knows if he can't schedule the visit to, to fix the stove, he's out 50 bucks with the part, and let's say, I don't know, I decide I can live without the oven, I don't know. So he might have paid for that part and now he's never gonna complete the job, so instead he asked me for $50 to cover at least that. And after that, if he never gets to do the job, then he hasn't lost any money. Next slide. So we're gonna go through now uh, some of the international risks. You know, could you, yeah, sorry, I put in one of those animations. Um, country risk. That's one of the first things you're going to look at. Um, and I see that, you know, it, I, I get the sense there's people from a lot of different countries in this room. So I'm going to apologize in advance if I happen to pick on a particular country. Don't take it personally. Um, but we do know when we look at trade, we're looking at a few things. Uh, when we look at the country risk, we're going to look at what type of government does, it, does that country have? How stable is it? We're going to also look at um, the political side of things. You know what, if you don't mind just clicking yeah. through, I think there's like four more clicks and then we'll just get it all up there. Um, <clears throat> and there's one more, and that's perfect. Okay, so we look at country risk. There's a few, and we're gonna go through each of these in turn. Um, industry risk, certain industries have more risk and maybe it's because it's high tech and there's homeland security issues or you need licensing in, in order to ship. Um, bank risk, and we'll get into a little bit what the bank's role is in international trade. So we'll talk about that. Fraud. Let's go back to eBay. How do you know that the stuff is really being shipped to you? Maybe it'll be something else entirely, and that's what we talk about. Um, that's how it relates to the containers that Patty was talking about. And then piracy, uh, international property rights, is huge, especially from the U.S., because we are a country that is known to be an innovator. And so we have a lot of smart people who come up with new products and new ideas and we want to protect them, not just in the US, but as they go around the world. It's very important. So country risk, I talked about political, economic stability, exchange controls. Okay, that's a biggie. Because for instance, if you're shipping to Venezuela, which is not 
on the top of our favorite country list these days, but you ship to Venezuela, you have to know that Venezuelan exchange controls are very strict, and it can take up to 45 days to get the hard currency, the US dollars, that your buyer might need in order to pay you. You have to plan that in there. Um, import and export regulations, and it, who's heard of the US Patriot Act? Anybody? Okay. US Patriot Act is huge. It's what the Customs and Border, Con Homeland Security was basically founded on. I mean, this is their, their reason for being. Um, US Patriot Act is something that anybody who exports has to think about because they have to look at what is the technology and the product classification of what they're shipping. But importers also have to look at who they are buying from because if you're transacting with a company that, let's say, and you wouldn't even know about this, they're, they're affiliated or owned by somebody in Iran. Oops, you didn't know that. Well, guess what? Now, with US Patriot Act, you're supposed to know that. Um, so that's one of the things we tell trading companies all the time. You have to know your, your counterparty. Really important because you are, are on the hook for that. Um, storage facilities and ports also. Patty talked about the security. Um, we saw how much activity there was in that video. It looked like a really exciting place to be. And so wouldn't that be the kind of place somebody could maybe even slip into a container and take something? That's why they have seals now, right, Patty? And they have to really review the, the security. So you also want to think about if you're shipping abroad, what are the port facilities going to be like? What happens if your stuff gets stuck there because of some customs issue? Well, how do you know what's going to be there for your buyer to pick up? So these are all things to consider. The next slide. Industry risk, um, it really speaks more to which industries are more stable or less stable. Sometimes um, a high growth industry is going to be a very young industry. And so there is the likelihood or possibility, I should say, not likelihood, but possibility that your buyer might go out of business before the goods get to them. And, or maybe there is some issue in the industry that requires legislation or regulation that didn't exist when you were first looking at it. So it can change. That's a picture that can change. So you need to understand the industry you're selling into. Um, the product trends, I'll just mention a, a quick story. I think most of you are old enough to remember Razor scooters when you were little. Um, they were a really hot item. And I remember calling on a sporting goods company who was buying Razor scooters from Hong Kong. They needed not just to get their order in, but they needed to, to basically almost send a deposit because these Razor, razor scooters were flying off the shelves. And this seller didn't need our customer's order because he had plenty of other orders to fill. So these are the kind, some of the kinds of things that can go on. In the fashion business, I'll also mention very quickly, you know, when you have seasonal product, if, if things don't get shipped on time, you could miss your whole order with Macy's because your stuff got there too late for the stores and nobody's wearing yellow anymore. We're on to the next color. Um, bank risk, we're just going to go through this um, very quickly and, you know, we're, as, as an exporter or an importer, you have to consider who, what bank your counterparty might be using and it really ties a lot into country risk but also some of the other trade specific risks uh, relating to international payment mechanisms and I'm not going to bore you with that so we'll move to the next slide because fraud is a lot more exciting. Um, the, um, in, in international trade, um, and Patty can attest, one of the, the really important documents is a title document. This is for ocean shipments. It's called an uh, Ocean Bill of Lading. And it is a document that confers title to the goods in that container to, to you, as long as it says that it's yours. It's kind of like your house title or your car. Um, but if somebody dummies up a bill of lading and goes to the port and says, the stuff is mine, I mean, it, it could happen. I don't know how common it is with bills of lading, but certainly with things like commercial invoices, um, I'm sure Customs looks for this all the time, where Customs uh, you know, will, will levy duties on incoming products. So companies, exporters, or actually even importers might say, I want to reduce the amount of duty I pay so the invoice value that I want 
to be shown is going to be lower than the actual product value. That's a form of fraud. So fraud can be little, it can be big. Um, insurance is also something that is important in international trade. Did you see how high those containers are on that ship? And that's always the picture that the cargo insurance guys show because if it all falls over, then where is your stuff? It's at the bottom of the ocean. And how are you going to get it? Well, you, hopefully you have insurance because you're not going to get the stuff, but maybe at least you'll be covered if you make a claim under your insurance policy. Now, if you have fraudulent insurance, then that's not good for anybody either. Um, cargo theft, we mentioned briefly as well. Piracy, I mentioned international, intellectual property rights, reverse engineering. Anybody want to take a stab at what reverse engineering is? Okay, did you ever take apart something when you're a little and put it back together once you figured out what was in it? That's reverse engineering. You put it back together. Actually, it, it's something that is very common in China since probably the 70s, um, where I've heard stories from, company, from, from people that worked for IBM and other large US <laughs> companies where they've sold, usually it was a piece of equipment, um, I think it might have been Caterpillar or Sperry, but it was like a big tractor. And maybe, maybe they sold five to the Chinese. And the salesperson follows up, he goes to visit, and they show him very proudly, this was back in the 70s, some multiple of, of the equipment that they had basically reverse engineered and built. So that goes back to intellectual property rights. When you are in a country that is known to be innovative. Um, this is why there are things like patents and protection for inventors to allow those inventors and the idea people to maintain control. Uh, it's something that a lot of companies think about only in the context of the US, but as they move into the international market, they really have to make sure that their, their brand, their patents are enforced internationally. And that's more where the lawyers come in. I don't know much about that. Thanks. So, um, anybody have any questions? There's a lot of risks, aren't there? I mean, it, it can seem daunting, but yes. The legal, if it's oh, the illegal stuff. Um, you know, if, I don't know, if Homeland Security, they junk it? Okay, so if something illegal comes in, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't even get sent back. Okay. Is that answered? Unfortunately, yeah. I thought they would, one point we talked about it, maybe it's changed, you know, and I'll send them an email and ask them. But I went to the usually it's clothing, the fashion industry, the handbag, the shoes. And I went to them, why don't you just donate to shelters? because I'm not sure I heard it. I heard government and drugs. That's what I heard. <laughs> and we can talk more about what you think is the security and want to get down to the degree. I don't know. She wants to know about drugs. I don't know. Should we worry? <laughs> I don't know anything about that. Not deliberately, anyway. <laughs> so if somebody's shipping drugs into the States and it's not strapped to their body, you mean? I believe that the government is like purchasing and doing it. I mean, besides, besides, besides the private. Do you mean illegal drugs coming in or pharmaceuticals that are being shipped to other countries? Is it the same thing? But they're just legal, like coffee? It depends on your perspective. Oh, uh, well, it's a drug. Now, so they have they come in. What is it? You're talking about alcohol and tobacco. What is actually firearms? What is pharmaceutical? It depends on what the end purpose can be for what they're bringing in. 
how dangerous that product really is. But that's, that's what I'm asking you. Like, if it's illegal and somebody gets caught with the over the foods, why would they just dump it? What if somebody finds you? I'm like, sure they won't dump it because that's bad. I'm not saying they throw it in a garbage can. I'm saying they're actually going to destroy it. Okay, they might throw it in, they'll actually destroy it. That kind of thing. So when you see the picture of the cargo, illegal cargo seized at a port, that's the last you'll see of it. Right. But I'll double check and find out where different products go as they're seized. Okay. Does that answer the question? Sort of? I just feel like besides private, you know what neither of us is for one of the is from the DEA so we really can't comment on that <laughs> okay all right any other questions that I can answer <laughs> so follow up what he's saying and you know just a little small question because they all form governments that do actively sponsor Production of uh, the poppy fields and uh -huh. so on. Okay, Afghanistan. I just wanted to add a support to what you, you said. You know what? So that there may be some element of impropriety taking place by foreign governments to get drugs into the country. Okay, you know what? When he said government, I thought you meant U.S. government. So I thought that were, it was more of a conspiracy theory than I was thinking of. Guess, or, or uh, okay. Well, still, I don't work for the DEA, so I can't comment. Was there another question I heard? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's a good question. The question was when you're going back, uh, taking a step back to how do you determine um, how, how t if you're going to lend money to a company or even a person. And it, it takes place at different levels. Um, under a certain amount for small business, there is what we call a, a credit scoring system, and it is an automated process. So how many of you have taken accounting? Um, if you've taken accounting, then you know about turnover ratios, leverage, and asset uh, quality, and so forth. They look at those ratios and determine, uh, basically, if it meets certain hurdles. That's on the small business side. As you become a bigger company and probably a little more complex, we still look at those ratios, but then if there's a story, like maybe last year wasn't such a good year, we're not going to meet those hurdles, but we have terrific projections, we've already got orders for this year, um, then if there's a story, the bank may be willing to, to listen to that. Because, any, because it's not just about the ratios, it is about the story. People bank with people. And let me tell you something, too. One of the things that we look at any bank looks at when they lend money is what we call character. Not that we're not all characters in this room, but do you have character? And it feeds into, it, it, it all keys off of how do we perceive the risk of non-payment by this borrower? So if they are, um, appear to be an ethical, well-grounded person who we would expect to be paid back by, then we, we assess that character and we assign that a certain, a certain value, if you will. Yes. So you only assess that through risk and asset? Sorry? You only assess that through risk? So risk ratio? Um, well, there's a whole slew of, of ratios, but it's, it's not just ratios. I mean, as I said, on the really small business level, you know, the corner deli or some, something like that, anything basically less than $350,000 in terms of a loan, we're going to look, because there's such a volume, it really becomes an issue of how are you going to manage the volume of requests? So you have to automate or systematize how you're going to review all these requests. So you do have to assign certain, certain things. And it's kind of probably like the difference between taking a math test and, and taking a, an English or history test where you have to write essays, right? On a math test, your answer is either right or, or wrong. You can't fudge that. Oh, except if you did show your work, then you might get a couple extra points, right? And then there's extra point questions. So, but still, the answer is pretty black and white. But if you write, if you take a social studies or a, or a history test, um, and you make an argument a certain way, well, maybe the professor doesn't agree with you, but maybe you laid out your argument very well. So then, you know, there might be more subjective, I guess that's one more subjective criteria. And so that's what happens. Um, as it goes up, but at the same time, you still, we're still, the banks are still looking for, for solid companies where the risk of repayment 
is minimal. That help? Well, wouldn't it be to you if, if that's what we sell? We sell money. I mean, I mean, obviously, but I mean, I think, you know, number two would be, you know, keeping the customer interested in the company, you know, wanting the customer to come back and also having them pull their friends and, you know, other businesses partners in. Absolutely. And that's really the next, the next level. We determine that we want your company as a customer, and then what we do is we really try to develop a relationship where you'll have people from the bank calling you, wanting to take you to lunch, wanting to get to know you better, and so forth. And that happens also before they actually make the loan, because they're still getting to know you. But you're right, customer service is huge. But, so it's, it's two things, and it's, it's a balancing act. You want to keep customers happy, but you want to know that we'll, we'll be paid back, too. So you have to balance those two things. And I'll come right back to you, Miss, but there was a question in the back. Um, in regards to risk, how long do you think it will take for uh, creditors to start doing back to that level of stuff that they had previously, or is it still going to be stringent rules in order to get money from banks? Um, it's a tough question. I, nobody could predict it. It's already started to get better. I mean, last year was just like a total freeze in a way. Um, it's already started to get better. And, you know, basically what anybody will tell you, and this is not necessarily trade related, but your credit score is really important for everybody in this room. And you, you've got to treat that like gold. And you know what, if something happened, that's okay because you can always work back from that. Um, so I, I don't know how long it'll be, but it's already gotten better. Yes. Uh, what I wanted to know is how does the bank um, look at the different risk. If you have two companies that are directly competing with each other coming to you for facilities. We're going to look at each company uh, based on its own merits. If you're asking me if we would choose one versus the other because they're competitors, my answer to you is no. What we won't probably do is we'll probably assign two separate lenders to those accounts. If, depending on the type of company, I mean, we've seen situations where, um, uh, going back probably about 10 or 12 years, there were, they, in Brazil, they were doing a huge project for um, surveillance of the Amazon, and um, where we might have been dealing with one of the bidders who could potentially win that deal, then somebody else in the department had to deal with the other competitor. You couldn't one person deal because there was a lot of competitive information. Having said that, any, any lender, for instance, in our textile and apparel sector, those lenders handle competitors all the time because they're all in the same sector. Um, so there is, that, that's really where our fiduciary responsibility comes in. You know, all the privacy laws you always have to sign when you go to the doctor's office and other things. Well, we have the same thing. If you asked me, well, how much are you lending to my competitor down the street. I can't even tell you that they're a customer. No. But in your instances where, where you would have, like, you know your bank is supposed to be your advisor as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at advice, you have two, peop two companies competing against each other uh -huh. and you are the loans officer, how do you advise each of them in terms of improving on their business? You know, it, it still goes back to business fundamentals. We're going to be looking at the business, um, if if uh, because you're you're if you have an industry specialization within the bank, you're going to be talking to different companies who all compete with each other. Um, so again, it goes back to privacy and fiduciary responsibility. And so we would give you the advice that you need based on your company and what your goals are as a company. Um, your goals might be different from the other company, even though you're competing. Maybe you're looking at different markets. Maybe you're going about it a little differently. Uh, so, but, but that if, I, I'm getting the sense that you're talking to a banker and you're not sure if there's, that maybe your competitors are also, but the bankers do have the responsibility to keep each discussion separate and private. Okay, thanks for the question though. Um, refer to the competitors, how about like the shipping company? You mean if, if Patty was selling freight space to one customer versus another? Uh, yes, like, uh, like, uh, wh like which co shipping company is the most competitive? Like, 
in the U.S. or in the world? Like I'm gonna. Let, it's probably K-Line, but I'm gonna. T- <laughs> I'm gonna let Patty take that. <laughs> That's actually a great question. Um, we basically have a guideline of rates um, for containers to the west coast, and containers to the east coast, and we, we it's a box, to us a box is a box. But we try to keep into perspective the value of that cargo. If you're bringing wearing apparel and the value of that cargo might be twenty thousand dollars, or you bring in electronics and the value of that container might be worth three hundred thousand dollars, then while it still costs us the same to move each container, we will charge you more for a better product. Um, We charge more based on the port it's coming into and the service that it's going on and where it's coming from, how long the transit times are. If it takes us more fuel, we're going to charge you more. If it's coming into the East Coast, we're going to charge you a little bit more because we want you to help put the bill for the Panama Canal. If it's coming to the East Coast, we want to charge you more because it takes far more fuel to come to the East Coast than just to the West Coast. So there are different surcharges added to the base rate to determine. And each carrier, there are, there are many of us in the industry, we all have different services. Sometimes I might be faster from Shanghai, and my competitor might be a little bit faster from Taiwan, and someone might be a little bit faster from Korea. So depending upon where you're bringing your product in from, you might choose. You might choose to have a little bit longer transit time, and we might charge a little bit less. So you've got a lot of options. You just have to decide how fast you want your cargo here, and what you're willing to spend, and how reliable that carrier is. You know, a big example, I talked about that we have appointments at the Panama Canal. That shows that we are just in time to the day reliable. But we're telling the canal we're coming in on a Wednesday because we're docking at the Port of New York Wednesday afternoon or Thursday morning. We're coming in Wednesday. And to a customer that's going to want to make the shelf life for a big sale or in time for season or Christmas or spring, that's everything to importers today. They don't have time to miss their delivery dates. You know, but I'm glad you asked the question using the term supply chain. You said your question was what supply chain products do you tie into? Because when we talk about supply chain, um, we're really talking, does anyone want to take a stab at what supply chain really means? And it could have more than one meaning, yeah. Supply, say that again? A, A bit like supply and demand. Yes how much money you're actually will, willing to spend? That's going to flow into the supply chain, how much money you're willing to spend. That's actually the flow of merchandise all the way from security raw materials, getting into the uh, container and then manufacturer to the manufacturer to the purchaser that we purchase and that evolves to the system. Perfect. Exactly. It's really the end to end from when it kind of can match the cash conversion cycle that I mentioned before, but you're absolutely right. It's from the raw material to when the bu- to the buyer. It starts with the raw material provider to the actual buy end user, I should say, not even buyer, because there could be a buyer here, but an end user over here who's buying from from an importer. So that's what supply chain is. So, but there's two kinds of supply chains. Patty's supply chain is logistics. And it, and it might be planes, trains, and automobiles, right? And the supply chain that we talk about in banking has to do with the flow of financing along the supply chain because the way we look at it is if you figure that every, every participant in that supply chain, and really it's mainly the buyer and the seller, but, but there might be a middleman along the way, might have to borrow money along the way, and it's all about the cost of money. So when you rationalize your supply chain, It's really about can you minimize your financing costs, not just for you, the buyer, but also for your seller. So through the supply chain, how can you get that cost down? And I imagine in logistics, it's also similar. How are you going to get the cost down while still maintaining the efficiency and getting to getting goods where it needs to go in time? Uh, So it's it's about optimization is is what a lot of companies look at. Yes. Yeah. um, This question for both. How do you finance your ships and international trade products and services? Okay. Well, I think for the ships, I think that K 
Kayline probably borrows money. <laughs> yeah, Kayline borrows house. money. Kayline actually is, is Kawasaki, and we're a national flag carrier of Japan. Some of the um, steamship lines are national flags of their country. We have Evergreen, which is Taiwan. We have um, APL, which is American flag. Maersk is uh, Dutch. Kayline is Japanese. So from the beginning, we are protected and financed by Japan, and trade with Japan is our number one you know, preference there. As far as the rest of it goes, we really are looking now to understand what our operating costs are, as we talked about, with fuel, with the bunker, with the canal, and that's how we're knowing how to charge our customers differently than we used to charge them before. We would instead of giving them, it's gonna cost you $3,000 from Tokyo to New York, now we're gonna say it's gonna cost you 2,000 for the box, and you're gonna share in the expense of the fuel and the Panama and all the other expenses that we've always had, and now we're breaking out for the customer to take a part in that program, that financial burden that we have, because we have no choice. Containers get old, chassis, equipment, we need to buy more of it. You know, we're not gonna sell you a leaking container. They've gotta be beautiful equipment. So we're asking everybody to buy And this stock, you know, Kaylin actually just went um, on the exchange I saw last month, and they're selling shares of the company. No one told me to buy it, which kind of concerned me. I thought when you like know something new, you I should go, and I thought the economy is supposed to be great. But I didn't. But I see they're reaching out. They obviously have people who are willing to buy some shares of the stock right. to get so, some more money. So either through the capital markets or through banks, companies typically can get financing. Or investors, I should say, also. also He's just finishing and then we'll get to it. What is one of the top products included in export that would love to finance? Um, I mean, I could say textile and apparel is huge. Uh, so, go into any department store or big box store and let me ask you how many things are actually produced in the U.S. So, all of those consumer goods that you see, whether it's electronics or clothes, those are 98% imported products. I think with the, uh, one of the handouts that the Port Authority um, gave yeah. us to present to you gives you a lot of statistics about tonnage and commodities and trading partners. Right. So I think that might give you some more insight into a longer list of what we have and what we're using. And then actually to follow on something that Patty mentioned earlier about um, the products that have been listed. On the export side, I'll just mention the waste paper, you know, the cut up, the craft board, the box when it's done. Um, also, uh, scrap steel, huge export for the U.S. It does, it's not garbage. It's actually recycled into new cars or, or other things using those same materials. So, yeah, um, sorry, there and then, yes. Can you briefly mention insurance before? And I was wondering um, if there's a specific company that you guys go through for insurance. And if, let's say, I know when I send something out through mail, I'll pay for the insurance ahead of time. And right. they'll delay it and they'll explain right. like, how much is worth. Yeah. You know, um, and then mm -hmm. they'll assess how much the insurance is. Is that right. how it works for cargo shipping as well? It kind of does. Um, it, it depends on the how active the international trader is. Yeah, it, it really it depends upon the value of the product you're shipping and the country risk level that you're shipping it to or from. Right. right. Um, because and the logistics of getting it to that destination might be far more complex than just bringing it from here to you know save <coughs> more. And having said that, you know you send one letter twice a year. Um, but if you're sending or bringing in containers constantly, you will probably have a marine cargo insurance policy, kind of an umbrella policy, and you'll declare all your shipments in and out so the insurance company knows. And they have a, a limit, a cap, on how much they'll, they'd be willing to insure. And they might even designate which, which countries they're willing to insure and, the, and that sort of thing. All right. Um, gentleman in the middle, and then... Let's see, um but they're not counterfeit, right? Patty just talked about what happens to those. <laughs> okay. Nice handbags. I have a buyer that would take out the entire shipment to the US. What would you force the guy to buy? Come to you? Would you fund something like that? Or would I come to you force or set up the deal force? You know, it's. It, 
it has to almost be parallel. A lot of times what happens is importers, um, they find a supplier and they set up their deal and then they say, oh wait, I don't have the money to pay for that when it comes in, what am I gonna do? So when you're talking with the buyer, or maybe you come back from China or maybe you just make contact on the internet or whatever it is, that's really when you should be talking to your, your banker because you actually wanna know how much it's gonna cost you to finance that purchase if you have to borrow money so that you can kind of think about that and prepare for it. It's actually even more important when you're selling to somebody because you want to make sure you build in all your costs. So you want to you want to make sure if you're, you know, that you're dealing with a bank that can support your financing needs. And depending where you are in your company life cycle, you may or may not need an international bank, but at some point you might have to think about it. So it really is a parallel discussion. Okay. In the industry, when you import, you could call upon the services of what's called the customs house broker. And this, okay. So that would be, honestly, the first person that I would connect to if I want to import something new is go to a broker and say, this is what I want to import. They'll automatically tell you if there's a problem with the product. They'll make sure that the, um, the product number and the tariff code of that number is correct with Customs and Border. They'll tell you if the country you want to trade from is in the book of acceptable countries to trade from. They even have a resource sometimes of factory names that might have been on like a watch list. So I would always go to a, a good customs house broker first and use their services to get you started. Andre would finance it, but they would really give you a lot of behind the scenes insight. And once you know then you can do all of this, then you would come to me, or you could do it even in advance, I would tell you what the price would be. It wouldn't matter, so I could tell you what the cost would be, and you could cost average it out based on you know, how many pieces you're going to get in that container. So it's really a three step. Pull. Yeah, yeah, but not step one, step two, step three, they kind of no, all happen all the same at the time. same time. All right, one more question, and then I need to just, I have a few more slides to get through, because I know we're, we're starting to have to wrap things up, but go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering if um, a set of things like that, you would actually fund on something like that, or do you go, go based on a credit score? Or you... Well, we're going to look at the credit score. We're going to look at the company or you as an individual, depending how you're set up. Do you want to put uh, your to wife or your, your child up for collateral? That might help. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, I don't think children are such <laughs> are always. <laughs> I know we get that a lot, but you have, and that's a great start. But now you have to make sure you have the money and the transfer. It's a the challenge, cost. and yeah. and that's also why you know we're talking today about two specific areas, but within finance, there's government programs like the SBA that if you need. Um, initial supporter, even some of the, the New York City and state agencies will, will help with that kind of thing. But when you get to, when you're thinking about that, talk to your bank too. They might be an SBA lender. All right. Okay. Um, so can I just I just have a couple real quick um, because this is actually why I'm here is because of what banks do, and I wanted to talk real quickly about the infrastructure that banks provide to you when you're doing international trade. Did I get to your question? Sorry. You sure? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll, we'll come back if we have time. Um, so international banks, you know, trade is not new. International trade is not new, and there have been ships coming across the ocean for five, six hundred years, and that's how long international trade and all the problems that come with it have, have been around. And one of the issues we've already talked about, which is, do you know your counterparty? And are you willing to take their risk? Do you know they're going to ship? So just imagine 400 years ago, you decide, and we can go back to economics if everybody remembers comparative advantage, absolute advantage, France and England, cloth for wine, all of that. OK, so who's going to ship first? Who's going to pay first? Well, 400 years ago, you couldn't Google somebody on the internet and find out if there's anything bad about them. You couldn't go on a government website to see if on, they're on the OFAC list. So what do you do? Well, you get the banks involved because the banks had a special language they could talk to each other through hard copy letters that probably took a month to get from one place to another. And they were, would be maybe a special stamp or some kind of um, communication where it, they, they are providing, the bank would be saying, basically what would happen is the buyer's bank would say to the seller's bank, my buyer is good for the money and we stand behind the buyer 
and there'd be a special stamp and some way for that bank, bank in France to know that when the wine leaves, they know that the payment will be coming. We do the same thing today, just a little differently. It's electronic, it's a lot more efficient. We still speak a, a, a different language, our own language, and it's through something called SWIFT, and I can't remember right now what the acronym is for, but it is a secure method of communication between banks. Corporates actually cannot access currently this method of communication. It's bank specific. Um, so the banks, we make sure that we know each other. Um, Banks, our bank, HSBC, we have um, lots of branches around the world in 80 countries, but in addition to that, we also have about 3,000 correspondent banks. That means we have a dialogue or relationship with 3,000 other banks who are not us around the world. And why is that? That's because if you're gonna ship to Turkey or you're gonna ship to Venezuela or Nigeria or China or pick any place in the world, uh, South Africa, then we want to be able to support that trade by knowing a bank or multiple banks in South Africa or China, wherever it might be, because your counterparty might be dealing with that other bank. They're not going to deal with HSBC everywhere we go. We're not always going to, we are not that arrogant that we think that we're the only bank in the world. So there's 3,000 other banks in our correspondent network, and that's who we can talk to when you have a trade transaction. Next slide, please. Um, so this is really what we do. We reduce risk, we improve cash flow, which goes back to what I said initially. Um, and we do that by financing parts of the trade cycle, whether it's for the purchase of raw material by the manufacturer, or whether it's the buyer who needs financing because by the time they sell to the end user and the end user pays, 30 or 60 days have passed and they need financing. So that's really what the banks do. Um, we help you reduce risk because we understand, or we like to think we understand, the country risk that we've been talking about. We might have some specialization in an industry so we can understand that industry risk. We definitely want to make sure we know the bank risk, the risk of the bank on the other side. And we actually have, most, most international banks do have, um, a constant interface with the uh, Department of Treasury where the Office of Foreign Assets Control is. Because those are the people, that agency maintains the bad guy list, that's what I call them, uh, specially designated nationals, all of those, because we need to make sure that if we're involved in a wire transfer or a letter of credit or any kind of transaction, we also are highly regulated. We need to make sure that you are not dealing with somebody who's one on one of those bad guy lists. So that's how the banks help to support international trade. And I think we just have one or two more slides. Um, the other thing to know, just real quickly, international regulations governing trade. Um, there is an international court in The Hague, but there are also guidelines called uh, Uniform Customs and Practice for Letters of Credit. This is if you ever have heard of letters of credit or find yourself hearing about them. This is, uh, these are guidelines that all banks throughout the world follow when managing those letter of credit transactions. Um, URC 522 also is, is another set of regulations. And the next slide, please. Um, and and I'm, I don't mean to close on a down note, but you know, in international trade, especially since 9-11, all we hear about is compliance. It is so important. Now, the banks were highly regulated before 9-11, back, going back to the 70s, I think, the Bank Secrecy Act, um, and uh, so that we have to, we actually have to look at how much money, how much money do you deposit when you come to make a deposit to your bank? If you're coming every week and you're making deposits of $9,999, we might raise our hand and say, excuse me, why are you not just depositing $10,000? Is it because you know that we have to declare to the government that we have received a deposit for $10,000? And there are, it all ties into something called money laundering, and I've, I've actually personally known some bankers who've gotten in trouble for um, being involved in money laundering, not deliberately, but because it was on their watch. So we take that very seriously. If your job depends on complying with the law, then you'll make sure. Uh, but it's not a bad thing if you deposit $10,000 <laughs> once a week. It's okay. It's just that the government keeps track of money flows. That's all. But it's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that somebody's going to come to your house. Um, so, 
the, the other thing that the, the newer thing is the Patriot Act since 9-11. And so where we see this really impacting business is, um, I mentioned already, correspondent bank relations. We need to make sure we know who our counterparty banks are on the other side. Um, and as I mentioned, the OFAC screening. But really the most important thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is even if you don't work for a bank, but as soon as you're involved in international trade, you better understand who your counterparty is on the other side. It's your responsibility. So if you're importing, you need to know who, what company you're, you're working with. You need to do what they call your due diligence. So that's why I said there you have to know your counterpart on the other side. Um, and I think that next slide is probably... So this is just in summary, sort of what we've talked about. We've talked touched on a lot of things. Um, I guess we can take final questions. Let me start here because you've been very patient. Um, do you remember what your question was? Because yeah. if it was me, I wouldn't remember. How do you say to people, you know, if you're an ethical company, how do you, you know, dealing, dealing with, you know, communist countries? Okay, so the question is, if you're an ethical company, how do you deal with, company, uh, with countries that have different political systems? Yeah. It goes back to the fundamentals of business. We're not going to take the high road and the stand. If, if the U.S. government says you can't do business with Iran, Libya, and let's name a few others, North Korea, then we're going to follow those rules. The U.S. government has not told us we can't do business with Venezuela or with China. How much business do we do with China? That's the bulk of our business. So it's not the political affiliation necessarily, um, but we do look at that as part of the political risk. But you can still be ethical. Okay, and another question. And with with risk and do you and do you consider foreign countries you know for, with foreign companies higher risk because you know they're not in, in the states foreign companies who we might lend money to yeah we will actually then refer that to our locations in those countries not because we don't trust the foreign com but we don't have the the infrastructure to do our due diligence to okay. to assess the risk so we'll work here with U.S. companies, or we'll work with subsidiaries, of U.S. subsidiaries of foreign companies. That's fine, because again, we go back to the business fundamentals. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. that, and I don't know, Patty, you want to add to that? Basically, what it, what it comes down to when you are going to import a product, or we as the carrier are going to take your product, we are responsible, and you are completely responsible. You can claim you did not know. If you don't know who you're buying from, Get to know them. Go visit them. Have somebody visit them. Research who they are and what their product that they're making. You're responsible. Before your product, say in China, can get on our ship, you have to provide that document, that bill of lading that we talked about that's going to say everything about the shipment. Who made it? Who's buying it? Where it's going? What it is? How many pieces it is? And that container is then going to be sealed with a metal st strip, and there's going to be a seal number on it. And that seal number is actually going to be put on that bill of lading also. There are lots of checkpoints. If we don't have that bill of lading 24 hours before we sail our ship, it's called the 24-hour manifest rule, we will not take your cargo. We get an emergency flag from Homeland Security as a do not load DNL, and we do not load that container. So if we have any doubt at all, and the documents are not filled in properly, and we're not sure, and we don't know you, cargo's not moving. So security is absolutely number one, and it really covers all of us in global trade, whether we talked about insurance, whether we talked about finance, whether it's me in, in transportation and logistics, whether it's the law firms. Law firms are so busy working with their clients that they know what the legal ramifications are, and the accounting firms with classifications. So it just comes down to this industry that we're in, we love our industry. Global trade is very dynamic. It changes every single day. We're here because we want you to get to know it better and learn about it. And there are so many avenues to take. Think out of the box. Yes? Uh, what about internship opportunities? Um, you know, we're running late. I actually even had another presentation, which you could just post. So the association is very big on having um, student interns 
and internships. <coughs> Last year, we had a very bad economy, and internships were not coming in. This year, I'm receiving a lot of phone calls from members actually looking to hire entry-level students coming out of college, which is a wonderful, wonderful sign. And uh, they're very open-minded. And quite honestly, seeing, seeing the whole diverse room we have here, they're really looking for students that have you know, diverse cultural backgrounds, um, know other languages, have traveled to other places, have families from other countries, that you have an understanding of how other people live and think and eat and travel, and all that comes into play with the whole supply chain. So we're going to put together a program and students that are looking to work. Um, I don't know how many students here are going on beyond the two-year program. Um, do we have most, how many students here are looking for jobs after two years or are looking to go into, how about looking to go to college for another two? All right, excellent. Um, I think that's really important. I really do. I think the four-year degree is very important. When you move on, think about anything in international business, supply chain, international finance, anything that says global. You know, take those classes. If there's a supply chain course, take those classes. Take anything you can connected to our world and our industry. It's a great place to be. If you want to go into law or accounting or insurance or banking, do it, but do it from a global perspective. Don't think domestic. Strictly think international, because it's really right. Don't. Yeah, we are very biased. Yes? Uh, I have a question. Why is the advantage, let's say, if I have an account where I have a hundred and fifty thousand, and I go and take up fifty thousand dollars? Why do so you guys have too many questions? Why? I'm not in retail banking. I can't answer that question. <laughs> I don't work in a branch. <laughs> but let me tell you something. When, when we open accounts for companies or individuals, we do ask you, OK, what do you think? What do you project your average balances are going to be? And, and how many times do you think you'll be wiring, uh, making wire transfers? Um, out of the country, which countries? We're going to ask a lot of questions. Well, and it's all because of compliance. Well, directly for banking here, uh, like it's still the same thing, you know, and it all really ties back to the government is forcing us to be compliant and to keep track of any potential money laundering. Those questions don't mean you've done something wrong. It just means that we need to know for our records. That's all. So if you haven't done anything wrong, you shouldn't worry about answering those questions. We just talk about what we talked about before with the layered approach to security. There's a layered approach to every industry we have, and that's the banking approach. It's like a flag, blue, red flag, like why? So, hey, does anybody have a question about internship opportunities or career help? I'd like you, if you could, um, come up to the front um, and, and speak with uh, uh, yes. myself and Ms. Ty directly. Um, otherwise, um, thank you so much for your